My name is Jennifer Madrill. I'm the founder and executive director of Designers for Learning. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to give people opportunities to gain volunteer experience while at the same time helping underserved educational needs. This video is one in a series of interviews I conducted to gather additional perspectives as part of our Design in the Open Challenge, a professional development opportunity we're offering to explore ways to cultivate your professional presence in your chosen field. In this interview, I'm speaking with Jeff Gumas, founding director and president at CrowdEd Learning and a member of Designers for Learning's board. Our conversation is inspired by themes forwarded in the book, Show Your Work, 10 Ways to Share Your Creativity and Get Discovered by Austin Kleon. In this conversation, we contemplate the first two themes of the book, including theme one, you don't have to be a genius, and theme two, think process, not product. We join the conversation as Jeff provides us with his bio. Um, so my name is Jeff Gumas, and uh, I, I've been working with Jennifer on some things in the nonprofit space, which is a very new space for me. So the timing of uh, being introduced to this book and um, to having this conversation is actually very timely in terms of where I am in career transition. But my background is I um, started out my career as a teacher. I was a fifth grade teacher in New Hampshire, which is where I'm originally from and taught for four years. And over the course of that period, I got really interested in curriculum development, um, much because of the fact I, I didn't really like the materials that were made available to us, um, sort of the publisher materials that existed. And so I found myself developing a lot of curriculum over the course of, of time as I was teaching. And so it was sort of you know, two full-time jobs. One was, was teaching and, and, and planning and grading. Um, and the other one was sort of starting up new curriculum and developing projects and, and activities for students. And so I, I got to this point where I needed to make a decision because I couldn't do both uh, as with the amount of um, sort of focus that I wanted to. And so I chose the curriculum development route um, and moved into publishing. And so my past 15 years, and that brought me to Chicago, um, the past 15 years I have spent uh, in the publishing world working for a couple of major publishers, both in, in the elementary side when I started my career in publishing and then transitioning into some writing that I did for high school U.S. history. And then um, my sort of last transition before the current one uh, was moving into adult education, which wasn't necessarily a field that I sought out. It just sort of was the job that was available during the economic downturn of 2008, 2009. And interestingly enough, it was a sort of serendipitous match because uh, that's the field that I've, I've really found uh, a passion for focusing on uh, at this stage in my career. Um, so I did that uh, publishing for 15 years. My last eight was in the adult education space. And uh, about six months ago, I, I left my most recent position um, de developing curriculum and programs for adult and workforce education and started a nonprofit uh, that's called Crowded Learning. And uh, the organization is focused on taking open education resources that are available and free resources that are widely available online um, and trying to organize those in a manner that makes them more usable and makes them um, just more readily accessible to both learners and teachers. So it's sort of this problem that I noticed and it's, it's something that I want to focus because focus upon because I think there, there's a lot of promise in the, the free materials that are out there, but it's just sort of a, a wild west world. And so that's what I'm doing now. And uh, it's very interesting work. And again, as I said, because it's so new for me and just trying to sort of get my sort of foot in the water and, and make myself known within a sort of different area of the field that I've already been in for the past eight years uh, makes this very timely for me. Well, your introduction is a perfect segue to what I want to talk to you about okay. for, a lot, for a lot of different reasons. Um, just um, to let everyone know, um, Jeff and I have two different nonprofits, and we're actually um, collaborating on ways to meld the two initiatives we're working on. Designers for Learning is um, geared toward curriculum design, um, creating open educational resources, and as Jeff just indicated in his introduction, he's interested in the platform and, and getting it out to the adult educators that he's had the opportunity to work with um, over the past mm -hmm. decades or so. And um, 
So I, the, I invited Jeff for a lot of different reasons. One, he's an awesome guy. <laughs> and then uh, also um, the, the focus of this course, as everyone knows, is creating and developing a professional, profes a professional presence within a field. And in particular, a new field. We have a lot of designers that come to us as volunteers that are either accidental instructional designers or um, career changers or whatever it may be, or just maybe want to take that next step in um, moving into a different um, capacity within a field. And so as Jeff indicated in his introduction, he's at a great place within his career to talk about what some of the steps he's doing to design in the open or to show his work, which is the theme of the book, the Austin Kleon book that is the, um, the inspiration for our course. So what we're going to be talking about in, in this video is the two key principles within, um, the first two principles within Austin Kleon's book is you don't have to be a genius, which is principle one, and principle two is think process, not product. So I've shared with Jeff a couple questions that hopefully we can uh, we can get through some of the, the things that I wanted to talk about, but certainly if we deviate and talk about more interesting things, um, all the better. So what I want to talk about first, right. um, is this, uh, again, this is the first principle being you don't have to be a genius within your field to be a respected contributor. Um, and so as you indicated, yeah, you've been an educator all along, but all along you've also had career transitions and different things that, um, that you've tried to uh, you know, segue within your career and, and find different ways to find your voice. And so that process of finding your voice is really hard, especially when you're a novice and you're just trying to learn the vocabulary of the field or you're just trying to fight, figure out the players. And so one thing that um, I'm going to read a quote here that uh, Cleon talks about in his blog um, he says, if you want people to know about what you do and the things you care about, you have to share. Talk about the things you love, your voice will follow. And again, one of the reasons I invited mm -hmm. Jeff is because I'm so inspired by the way that he shares his voice in the field and taking this courageous, courageous step to, to leave a nice, comfortable job <laughs> where, with a regular paycheck and, and branch out and, uh, and found his own um, nonprofit. So, so Jeff, why don't you, I'll stop talking now, and I kind of wanted to frame what I'd, what I'd like to talk with you about by sharing those quotes, but now I'd really love you to, to share with your, uh, your perspective on the importance of finding your voice, mm -hmm. and then some of the processes you've taken to find voice, uh, your voice within your, your career. Yeah, so I, I'm really glad I got these two chapters of the book because it's, and again, the timing of the book is, is wonderful because I've, I've realized as I've been reading it that these are sort of, I guess, principles that I've always sort of lived by, but I've not been able to put language <laughs> to what it is I'm doing. And so I think when you're talking about finding your voice, um, as I was reading and as I've been thinking about each transition I've had, as I said, I've had a number of transitions, um, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I feel your voice is like, is your is your personal value as a human, as a worker, it's everything. Um, and if you're not using your voice, you're kind of a chameleon um, and, and you're not going to get where you want to be professionally not doing so. So, um, and I, it made me think actually when I actually transitioned into publishing, which was a very big move for me, I was leaving the classroom and I was moving into the corporate world. And my very first review with uh, my, my boss after my first year, I came in just guns blazing in terms of this is what I want to do. This is what I know works. This is what I did as a teacher. I was complete novice. I was not an expert and I was too dumb to, to care uh, at that point in my career. And what she said to me was, you're, you're like a golden retriever puppy. Everyone really likes you and you're all energetic and you're occasionally going to chew the furniture and you're going to pee on the carpet. Um, but everyone still loves you ever anyway. And, and that's interesting because um, that comment was in relation to sort of a fearlessness that I had going, going into this because I was passionate about why I was going into this field. And, and one of the things that um, the quotes that I liked from the book is, uh, is, he says, you, you can't be fearful because you're in love. Um, and I think it's interesting just looking at my career trajectory and, and thinking about it, like in terms of relationships, even like, you know, you're in love, you meet somebody and there's sparks and you're just, you're at this high. And then over time, you know, it, it just sort of goes down. Reality that's the reality it, right? <laughs> of, yeah, that's the reality. And that's work as well. And I've, I've found that in each of my jobs. Um, my sort of opus or the best thing I've ever done in any of these jobs has been right when I started because I wasn't ingrained in the culture. I didn't know 
um, sort of the, 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 the constraints that I was supposed to be working in. And so I had no constraints in terms of the way I would outwardly project what I thought should be done, what I wanted to do. And fortunately for me, in most cases, I've, I've had license to do so, um, at least at, at the start. Um, in, in my most recent um, gig, I guess, which was the longest, it was eight years, uh, it really was sort of this, this trajectory where my, my role and my position um, within the organization was going up, um, but I felt less and less uh, able to really voice the things that I, I, I really wanted to do um, because my mind was sort of crowded with, with the things that I'm supposed to do. And, and, you know, just the notion of, well, there's no way that that's going to happen here. And so I sort of lost my voice over, over time in, in that most recent position. And, and that's not to speak negative of, of my employer or anything like that, but that's, I think that's just the nature of life, right? Is, is you get comfortable um, and, and you just sort of work within the constraints or what your perceived realities are and you stop using your voice. And so, um, you know, I, I, I will say, I mean, it's a cliche, but I felt a little dead inside at, at a certain point, um, in that role because it just felt nothing that I really wanted to be doing was, was, was able to be done. And that may or may not have been true. It was just, I was using my voice less and less because I, I just, the, the barriers just seemed greater and greater. Yeah, and one of the themes um, that I, I take from the book, and not to be too weird and academic about things, but is this idea of reflexivity. And I'm going to talk about that a lot during the class, and it's kind of a word I'll have to keep evolving my definition of it. But um, again, I get a lot of questions from people, what can I do to stake a claim in this field? And I really don't look mm -hmm. at things as staking a claim. Um, I really like this idea of rex reflexivity, which means it's kind of the cause and effect, the give and take. So you're... Um, you're not just entering a, a static field, you're actually influencing the field by your actions. And I think it's just an, um, a more positive way to think about entering a mm -hmm. new field. You have things to give. And um, I try to instill that when people are asking me for advice, which I get a fair amount of people saying, well, what can I do? And I say, you have a vast array of experiences, maybe not in this field. And so um, mm -hmm. by you sharing what your passions are or the things you want to do, um, what you're working on, the processes you're taking, you're going, other people are going to be hearing you. And that cause and effect is going to change what their perceptions are of the field as well. And so um, I think that that's um, segue, as a, kind of a segue into my next set of questions it gets into what do you share? So if, um, if the idea is to share, share your work, design in the open, if it begs the question, what should I, what, what should I share? Because it's, what should mm -hmm. I share? Because it's kind of scary on a couple of levels. One, maybe you've got something really cool that may be proprietary within your organization and you can't share it. Um, and then there, in, in a quote from Cleon, I'm going to read again. He said, Trish, traditionally, we've been trained to regard the creative process as something that we should keep to ourselves. We're supposed to toil in secrecy, keeping our ideas and our work under lock and key, waiting until we have a magnificent product to show before um, we open it to the world and connect with others. Um, and then he goes on to say, but human beings are interested in other human beings and what other human beings do. By sharing our process, we allow the po um, possibility of people having an ongoing connection with us in our work, which help helps us to move um, more of our product. And so that, I think that he doesn't use the word reflexivity, but I think that to me is the heart of it is like you're putting things out there and because we're human beings, we interact with what we, each other is saying and that in, in turn changes thing, things. So I, you know, again, for a piece of advice to people when they ask, it's like get away from that idea that I need to learn the field so I know where I fit within the field. Well, no, you're now mm -hmm. a player. You're, no, you're a player in the field. So kind of looking at the pros and cons of that and, and what you share, like well, in, internally, what do you think about? Here you are, as you talked about, starting a new nonprofit and you're setting up a new product that you want to roll out. Like, how do you think about how much you're going to tell people you, about what you're working on? Either they could take your idea or they may think it's a stupid idea or, you know, you're putting yourself out there and it's kind of a raw, raw thing. So how do you perceive that and how do you address that? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so it's that's an interesting thing because again, having come from a corporate world where literally, you know, if it's a new project, oftentimes there'll be code names for the oh, project yeah. that are just like so nobody knows what it is on the outside. Um, 
you know, that's been something that I've, I've been grappling with in this process in terms of how open um, do do I make this. And, and given that what I'm doing is looking at open educational resources, um, it, it seems foolish to me to not be open in the process because that seems to contradict the nature of, of sort of the work that I'm, I'm trying to do. And, and that went back to even deciding if I wanted to be a nonprofit or a for-profit. Um, it, it, there's pros and cons to each of those, but in the spirit of what it is that I want to do with, with this work, it, you know, it, it seemed to be, again, it would be contradictory to try to, to be a for-profit company um, when you're talking about openness and, and, and free resources. So I went the nonprofit route. And even in that process now of sort of building the case and finding out what it is that's needed, um, there's two ways you can go about that. You can have these closed doors sort of conversations with people. And, and I've done that, you know, focus testing and working with folks within a closed environment, or you can be very outwardly open and, and try to gain input. And I think the latter is just a better process. Um, now I haven't, I'm in the process of doing this now and I've, I, I don't have evidence for that. But when, when you think about the, the way product development works or, or an idea sort of, you know, is, is sort of the seed is planted and then it grows, um, it, you're only going to have as much buy-in as people feel like they've had a, a part uh, in, in, in having a say in, in what it is you've, you've developed. And so I'm so happy to sort of be out there and talking about this because every conversation that I have with somebody, it, first of all, it leads to like, five new people that I need to meet um, because they're five people that I had no idea existed in this world that this person that I'm talking with is convinced would be interested in the work that I'm doing. Um, so the process that I've actually been going about is, is really just hitting the pavement, having conversations with people. Um, but in one of the things that, that um, Austin says in the book, he talks about if you're not online, nobody knows what you're doing. And so I've, I've been starting a blog and by way of just sort of looking at from my perspective where I see there are problems as a novice, um, as someone coming in with, with no experience in, in the OER space, at least the open education resource space, um, I'm, I'm throwing myself out there as, as again, just being too dumb to care, I guess in terms of saying, you know, this is what I see. And, and I mean, there's, there's plenty of evidence that says this is a problem, a barrier for um, open education resources being more used. And so I'm just talking about, you know, this is, this is why this is a problem and trying to relate it to sort of, you know, other things where I see there have been successes and saying, you know, this is how I feel. Um, we could address this problem. And every single time I say that, I'm, I'm giving away the, the 11 herbs and spices of the secret, you know, Kentucky fried chicken recipe that I'm trying to build here in terms of um, this is how I feel we can address this problem. And this is what I intend to do um, with, with the organization to try to come up with ways to, to address that. And, um, you know, by doing that, I, I'm getting feedback in terms of, you know, that that sounds like it would work or that sounds like it might not work. And if you if you don't put it out there, you're not going to get that honest feedback from folks and, and, and that true sort of understanding of how will this actually resonate and work with the person, the end user. Um, and that's really important. And I think when you come out with a shiny product that no, that nobody's known about and you just, you know, unveil the curtain, I think there's a level of um, suspicion or disingenuity, especially in education, that is the shiny new thing that's going to solve all problems, but you've had no input uh, in terms of the process of, of how it was built or why it was built. Yeah, um, you hit on so many things. And, um, and I've noticed as well, going into your field, I was never in adult ed prior to the last 24 months or so. And so I, I, I've never thought of it this way, but when you mentioned, you know, the, the, the young little puppy, <laughs> excited puppy. Um, so those veterans in the field, um, and maybe I'm misperceiving what they think, but I think um, they appreciate that I'm there asking them questions as a novice, you know, I'm there to learn. And um, everyone likes to teach and talk about 
um, what, what their mm -hmm. passions are as well. So I think there is that barrier when you're coming into a new field. It's like, wow, if I open my mouth, mouth I'm going to prove what I don't know. And that's okay. You know, I think it's okay to say, um, I, 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 and, and then at the same time, though, reinforcing what you do know and where, where as you said, what you think you're seeing and, and then try to get them to, to validate that. So that's one, one thing I took from what you were saying. And then there's also this idea of um, everything has to be perfect, perfect and a nice little bow on top before you share it. And, and I think you made a great point by saying, um, by including people in the process as you're going through it with a prototype, um, some type of diagrams, um, conversations, whatever it may be, you know, hitting them early, it, it allows yourself to do some um, formative evaluation as you're going through the process. And you're, as again, this whole idea of reflexivity, uh, you're putting yourself out there so you can get feedback and in turn make something that's going to be more valuable to those that you're, um, mm -hmm. you're, you're serving. So um, I did want to talk a little bit about this idea, though, what you put out there and it being messy, which Jeff and I have been working for the last two months on little scrap pieces of paper. No joke, we roll out banner paper and we have markers and we write and then someone will walk by the co-working space that we're at and like you want to bring them into conversation but you literally have like just great scribble marker letters on a, on a piece of paper so can you give a little bit of guidance on like how do you then convert these ideas in your head and those little scribble markers and the prototypes and things that you're working on yeah. to somebody like what is kind of the minimal viable um prototype that you that you try to get to to be able to talk to people and share once you kind of get a pretty firm idea in your head yeah, and this is something I think we're we're definitely learning <laughs> in this process. Um, you know, it, I I don't I don't know that I necessarily have a definitive answer. I I think it's it's you just got to keep showing it and and get feedback and listen. <laughs> I think listening is kind of the big piece there because, um, as you said, like I think people are more than willing to share their their expertise. They want to teach, um, and and they feel valued when when you listen. Um, to what they bring to the table, but what they're bringing to the table is experience that you don't have uh, and that needs to influence what you do um, in certain ways. So, yeah, the number of times that we've, I mean, you've, you've been in the room with me where we've shown something and it just doesn't feel like it's hitting, um, you, you've got to ask the questions as to why and, and that you can't be offended by that or embarrassed by that. Um, that's, that is part of the process is, is, is trying to just convey your message in a way that, that clearly resonates with people. Um, so I think it's, it is a lot of just going back to the drawing, the literal drawing board in, in the case as you've been describing, cause that's what we've been doing, um, is, is tweaking and, and the, you know, over time, I think, you know, people start getting it. The, the more you're tweaking it based on on their responses um you know as as you've experienced with me in this um you know uh, there's there's one sort of person in particular that we've been talking with and working with that it was such a euphoric moment when she said i'm finally seeing the pieces come together uh but that came after literally like iteration after iteration of of throwing something out there getting the sort of cross-eyed head scratching look and getting feedback in terms of um, just questions in terms of how, how would this do this? Or, you know, that's, that's one thing actually, is it's very easy to get embarrassed when someone asks a question that you haven't thought of mm -hmm. um, and you just can't mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because, you know, there, there's levels of getting into the weeds that you're, you're getting into in terms of this thing or this idea and there's level of the weeds that they've been into in terms of sometimes say the practical implementation or, or working with people um, and experience in the field. And um, so it's that give and take of sharing and listening, I think is, is the most critical piece in terms of, of uh, and it's the most um, valuable aspect of, of showing your work and not being afraid uh, to show it. Um, each step of the way. I mean, I've used this term and then yeah, I think you laughed when I said this term, but it was in the book. Um, is, you know, show, people want to see how the sausage was made. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's important. I think even from that aspect, back to the sort of previous thing is that I think there is a higher level of trust, um, when you develop something where you've been sort of genuine in terms of what your lack of knowledge is. Um, but through that, that asking of questions, people feel that you've built something with them and for them as opposed to you trying to sell something to them. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. 
Uh, okay, we've got about five minutes. I'm going to try to keep these videos to about a half hour. So um, okay. uh, we can keep them concise. So this is perfect. And the, the last thing I would love for you to talk about, two different things sort of related. Part of the purpose of this course is also to help folks think of ways that they can start to show their work and how they can show their process and design in the open. And so you mentioned um, your blogging. So maybe if you could just, uh, first of all, just a couple seconds, uh, talk or a minute or whatever, talk about um, what that process is like and do you write to an audience? Do you write to yourself? Are you personally reflecting or whatever? And then we don't have a lot to talk about this But Jeff and I over the last couple of days have been thinking about a way that he and I can start a webcast series to um, so This is a very raw idea, but um, this whole idea we've been talking about the last 25 minutes of how can we start to expand our story to a larger audience to get more feedback to get the, the message out of what we, it is we're trying to achieve and, and show people our process. So let's just spend a couple seconds talking about first about your blogging and then maybe spend a minute or two talking about what your thoughts are on, uh, on starting a webcast because we, you and I have never done that together. <laughs> so that would be kind no, of a No, no. I mean, thing depending, on timing of, depending on the timing of this course, I mean, people could probably just like witness it in real time in exactly. terms of <laughs> how this goes. Um, yeah, so e even that is interesting in terms of, as I said, this this book putting language to the things that I've I've been thinking about over time. Um, I I wanted to blog, but I was fearful um, to actually just start because of the fact that the idea is unformed and the product isn't done. And, you know, coincidentally, I, I have a friend who has started a business um, and was doing so at the same time as me. And he's brilliant and has this amazing plan. And the second he sent me in his business plan, I almost like froze in my tracks because it was like, I haven't thought of any of this. Um, but that's because the, the process is, is what you need. And so I, um, I started the blog think, trying to sort of put out there, both as I said, uh, the ability to start dialoguing about what some of these issues are um, and, and putting my perspective to them in terms of um, how I felt they could be addressed, but also just as a way of, of sort of introducing myself to what it is I'm doing, who I am, my way of thinking um, in a very honest an open way and um, it, it's my very first blog actually because I literally was freezing on pulling the trigger because of that very notion of I'm going to feel stupid because I, I might say something wrong or I might say something that offends somebody and so my, my first first blog it was titled shouting out loud um, because I, I had never really said out loud to the world this is what I'm doing I you know friends and, and folks that I worked with obviously knew I had left my job, but it wasn't until about four months after that I even announced out into the, the world that this is what I'm doing and this is why, and I'm inviting you to kind of come on this journey with me. Um, and I, I did that because I just feel it's, it's the only way I, I can operate because I don't know everything <laughs> and and if I if I go into it with that notion I'm I'm one all I'm going to do is run into the fear of embarrassment for not knowing something as opposed to having the benefit of of meeting all the people I've met over six months and, and having conversations with them where they know that I'm a willing learner um, and that I'm with them in terms of wanting to address some, some core issues in, in the field of adult education. So, you know, I approach my blog as a way of um, sort of tackling these issues, making them relatable in some way. I always try to connect to something in my life or, or something that's tangible, like, um, you know, cutting the cord and cable. Um, and there's a reason that's happened in the real world. So why aren't we applying these practices to education? It's clearly there's a reason before behind it. There's a psychology behind it. Um, this is how I sort of live my life by that sort of psychology. So why aren't we applying these principles to education? So I'm just trying to do it in a in a sort of um, thoughtful way and, and like really getting into my head in terms of why I feel this is the way this this problem should be addressed. Um, and, and again, how I go about, or I think I want to go about, um, addressing it. Yeah. And, uh, so I love the exercise. Um, 
I, I do sometimes even within each blog sort of, I'm still sort of new. I mean, you know, I've only done five or six and I'm still I'm gun shy. I'm pulling the trigger because it's not exactly perfect, but I mean, I'll, I'll get over that. That's kind of the nature of blogging. Um, but it's, it's a really fun exercise, not only for inviting people in, but, um, to the point that I've said a couple of times now in terms of this book has put language to some of the things that have gone on in my head over my career and, and that, that have been sort of the, the factors behind transitions and thinking and when I've been sort of in the doldrums and not feeling like I'm doing, you know, my, my best work, um, blogging is a way of doing that for yourself too. So it is sort of cathartic in terms of being able to, you know, it's like diarying or journaling or anything like that. You're putting to paper your thoughts. Um, and unless you take time to do that, you're just going to be sort of grinding to the millstone every single day and, and not having that sort of reflection. So it is part, it's reflection with a purpose for me, I think. Um, it's helping me frame my ideas in a more tangible way, um, but it's also putting them out there in the world and inviting people to sort of come in and start tackling this problem with me. Yeah, and then um, perfect little uh, put a little bow on our conversation. As Jeff said, maybe people are listening to this at the point we already have some of these webcasts and the uh, webinars or whatever we're calling it in the can. Maybe they'll be out there for you to, to view. Um, but just as you said, it's uh, an opportunity to reflect on what we're doing, get the message out to a broader audience. And you said something else, they're not perfect, your blogs are, and I, that's one of the main things, my little taglines I usually mention in almost every one of our courses when we get to kind of that sticky point in the class when people are like, oh, I don't want to show my work yet, it's not perfect. I always say perfect is the enemy of good. People can't give you feedback on a blank piece of paper. And so by blogging right. and getting it out there, that's that opportunity. Same thing, that's our hope with our webcasts as well. And um, we'll see. We haven't done one yet, so we'll see how it turns out. So talk about Rob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. And um, yeah, fingers crossed our little project uh, works real well and everyone will be able to come back and look at this and go, oh that's yeah, great. they were designing in the open. <laughs> they, they practice what they were preaching. So. But thanks a lot, Jeff. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry the, the sun evidently came out during this, and I, I don't know what I look like in here. It's sort of from, like, heaven or something. But. It does look like you have an aura glow. It's great. No, again, I'm a guru. Again, we have good. We got this done. So thanks so All much, right. Jeff. Have a great day. Thanks, Jennifer. You Bye. too. Bye.